and our next uh, speaker is Imon Mondal who will tell us about integrated circuits for time scaling of analog pulses right hello am i audible Thank you, Gopal, and good morning to all of you, and thanks for showing up. Uh, I am Iman, and I am from this Integrated Circuits and Systems Groups in Electrical Engineering. Uh, I'll be talking on our work on integrated circuits for time scaling of analog pulses. Uh, let me start off by asking you this. What is the first thing that comes to your mind when I talk about 1947? Well, for us Indians, it's kind of obvious, right? However, if, you ask, if I ask you again, what is the second thing that comes to your mind when I talk about 1947? That might not be that obvious to some of you, but if you are also involved with integrated circuits, you might recall that 1947 was also the year in which the first ever transistor was reported out of Bell Labs. And the electronic industry after that started moving away from the clunky large vacuum tubes to much more efficient and vanishingly small transistors. About a decade later, in 1958, uh, this gentleman called Jack Kilby developed an ingenious way of designing a transistor on a thin silicon uh, germanium wafer. And the first ever integrated circuit was born. And this is a stripped down version of that same particular IC. It had 7.5 millimeter length and 1.5 millimeter of width. And this, by the way, was a single transistor. A few years after that, Gordon Moore, the co-founder of Intel, uh, wrote this seminal paper where he made some seemingly astounding predictions. And the chief among which was that transistor count in an IC will double itself in every two years. So what does it effectively mean is that it compounds at a rate of 41%. So put things into, to put things into perspective, let's say if your bank were to give you an interest of 41% on your deposits, then an initial investment of $100 will fetch you $1 billion in 2015. So I'm assuming that hasn't happened. But it has indeed happened in the world of integrated circuits. And uh, this is the chart of the number of transistor ground in a processor over time. Uh, if you can see here, this is from 1970 to 2015. And this is the number of transistors in log scale, which means that if you jump one major grid, you have to multiply by a factor of 10. And the Sandy Beach processor over here is the Intel's flagship uh, core i3, i5, i7 line of processors, which indeed house more than a billion transistors. So the question is, what does it mean, and why should we care? Uh, the picture to the left, you see some of the discrete transistors that you can buy today online for approximately 0.1 to 0.2 dollars a piece, and they take up an area of few millimeters squared. The picture on the right is a full-blown full -blown processor which houses more than a billion transistors, yet takes up a meager area of 150 millimeters squared, and you can buy it for approximately 200 dollars. So the key takeaway from this is that with integrated circuits, you can pack in a lot of features in a very small area, and you can do it in a fairly economical way. So if you are thinking of any hardware solutions in a large scale, then IC design is the way to go. However, there is one caveat here. Since we are talking of the dimensions of nanometers and micrometers, the IC fabrication industry will charge you for every micrometer square of your chip. So miniaturization is the name of the game here. And all these processors have one thing in common. We know that they can only process ones and zeros, the digital logic. However, the nature around this is all analog. So you need some sort of block here in the interface to make sure these analog signals get converted to their digital counterparts. And that is done by this block called analog to digital converter, or an ADC. The way an ADC works is it takes up an analog signal, samples them at periodic intervals of time, and assigns a bit code to each of these samples. In practice, this the sampling is done with a clock, which ideally comes, arrives at equal equispace time intervals. But in reality, nothing is ideal, and these clock edges are always shifted randomly from their preferred position, which effectively means that you end up sampling some erroneous signal, erroneous value. And this error is directly proportional to the slope of this curve at this point. Now put in other words, if this, if this signal changes fast, then around the sampling instance, you might incur larger errors. If I rephrase the same sentence, I can say that you will incur more sampling error if you are, try, if you are trying to sample a high-frequency signal with a clock of certain amount of jitter. 
Now there exists some applications which require sampling of these high frequency signals which appear infrequently in time. And some of the examples that come to mind are radars or through wall imaging or even some wireless gaming systems. So this a high frequency pulse comes along, you have a long no activity period, then another pulse comes along and so on. So one of the way to ease the burden of the ADC is, is if in principle we can stretch these pulses in time, then you can in principle use a slower and a more accurate ADC with a low, lower sampling error to do the digitization. On the other hand, all these applications that I talked about require access to these high frequency pulses. Also, in order to test them in our labs, we need access to these high frequency pulses. Which, and as it turns out, again, uh, these, you know, these high frequency signal generators are really expensive and their costs go up as the required bandwidth increases. So if we can do just the opposite, that we take a low frequency pulse and compress it in time, we can in principle generate a high frequency signal out of a low frequency signal generator. And this is actually done in reality and the most typical architecture that is used is the following. And the way it works is, 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 is this. Let's say this is the Gaussian looking input pulse and we want to stretch it in time. So you multiply it with a chirped carrier. A chirped carrier is basically a sinusoidal waveform whose instantaneous frequency increases with time. So you see the wiggles getting close by as you um, move to the right. So this output is the same chirp, chirped carrier whose envelope has gotten modulated. Then you pass it through a dispersive medium whose frequency response is such that its delay increases with frequency. Which means if you, if you pass a high frequency signal, it will get delayed more than its low frequency counterpart. So this high frequency trailing edge will get delayed more than the low frequency leading edge, resulting in a stretching of this envelope. Then you can use some sort of envelope detector to take the output. Now, this dispersive medium is basically some sort of a fancy delay line. And as it turns out, in integrated circuits, it's very difficult to make wideband delay lines which can provide large delays. So much so that almost all applications which use this architecture end up using its off chip dispersive medium. But for this one, which we, uh, which we found in literature, which uses a, an on chip uh, LCR delay line, it's working somewhere near the resonance. Now the problem with using inductors on an uh, in integrated circuit is that they do not scale with technology. And the intuition behind is that in order to achieve certain value of inductance, uh, 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 inductance can, you can define as the area a circular wear encompasses. So if you want a certain amount of inductance, you will have to dispense with that much amount of area. And because of that reason only, this particular application takes up an area of approximately 4.5 millimeter square while ex demonstrating a pulse width expansion factor of approximately 2x. Uh, the way we got around this problem is by recognizing this. Uh, let's say this is a classical first order RC circuit where this capacitor has some initial voltage of VC0 and you turn on this switch as t equal to 0. So this voltage will discharge with this uh, equation V dot e to the power T by R minus T over RC and it looks like this for RC equal to 1 second. This can also be thought of as the natural response of this system subject to the initial condition at t equal to 0. Now somehow if at this time t equal to 0, I change this bandwidth of the system, reduce the bandwidth of the system by factor of 2x by increasing r by factor of 2, then you get this red curve. Notice that this red curve is basically a time stretch version of the blue curve. Or in other words, the natural response of this first order RC system circuit got scaled in time by factor of 2 when you reduce the bandwidth by a factor of two. Now this is not particular to this first order RC circuit. It is a fundamental principle of any linear time invariant network. And this particular paper uses this principle and shows us a way forward. Let us consider this H of alpha S to be some linear time invariant network whose job is to delay the signal by, a, by some, some time interval tau. So you have an input here, it gets delayed by tau. Also consider that, let's say this tau is such that it is more than the width of this pulse W. So it is in principle possible to find some time T naught where the input has died down and the output has still not started to come up. So if an observer starts his observation at time T equal to T naught, he will observe that the input is zero, output is zero, and there are some states of the filter which are loaded. The natural response of which is this Gaussian looking pulse. Now from our earlier arguments, if, if he goes and changes the fact bandwidth of the, reduces the bandwidth of the system by factor of two, 
the natural response will also get scaled in time by a factor of two and you get a wider output pulse. And in order to compress the system, compress this out, compress the input, you'll have to do just the opposite. That is, you start with a low, low bandwidth mode and go to the high bandwidth mode. And note that the core of this implementation is a filter which delays its in input by considerable, considerable amount. And as I mentioned before, designing on-chip delay lines with large delays is a difficult thing to do. And we got around this problem by recognizing this. Uh, let's say this is a singly terminated transmission line which is open circuited at one end and terminated with its characteristic impedance at the input. Now if you launch a pulse of height A at time t equal to zero, uh, the same pulse with A by two amplitude will be available at V1 at t equal to zero and it will move all the way to the right and after some time TD it will appear at this output. Now since it sees an open, ter open circuited termination, it will get reflected in its entirety and appear at this, at this node V1 after time 2TD. And since, it is after, then since this is traveling towards the left and sees a perfect termination, it will get fully absorbed and there will be no more activity in this line beyond time to equal to 2TD. So if I see this entire sequence of events in a time scale, note that X axis is time now, then this is your input and this is the uh, excitation at node V1. So a simple arrangement of 2V1 minus VI will get rid of this incidence pulse and we will leave the reflected pulse, which is nothing but a proxy for the delayed input. Now note that you have this entire time interval between input and the output where the input has died down and the output has still not started to come up, which means from our previous arguments, we can change the bandwidth of the system anytime in this interval. And we also know that uh, transmission lines can be thought of as cascades of some sort of inductors and capacitors. But as I mentioned before, inductors are area intensive and we as circuit designers do everything that we can to get rid of inductors. And we play a few tricks and to explain one of them, I'll take a 30 second detour. Uh, let's say this is a, some block, let me call it a GM, whose property is to spit out a current I which is proportional to this input voltage V. That is I equal to some GM times V. And the beauty of this is that it, 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 this current output is regardless of whatever it is driving. And as it turns out, in reality, we can make a fairly good job of designing this GM with only transistors. And if you, we can show that if you use four of these GMs and stick a capacitor in between, this mimics an inductor of value C over GM squared under certain approximations. So where, whenever you see this inductor, you replace it with this entire contraption. So here you have these inductors L2, L4, and so on. So if you replace them with that contraption, you end up with this architecture, which is our delay line. Now, from our first, first order RC, going back to our first order RC network, we showed that in, or, we, in order to change the bandwidth, we kept the capacitance constant and we doubled the R in order to reduce the bandwidth by a factor of two. That is, we kept all the frequency dependent, we kept all the frequency dependent uh, components unchanged, and we changed, doubled all the frequency independent components. Uh, using the same analogy, we kept all the capacitor constant, and we can change these GMs by a factor of alpha. Alpha is user controllable electronically. And we designed this chip in a standard 130 nanometers uh, CMOS technology. It takes up an active area of approximately 1.5 millimeter square. This is a die micrograph under a microscope. And you can readily see that this is uh, an improvement of almost 3x over the state of the art. Uh, let me show you some measurement results. Uh, this is the input of the filter, and this is the output when this expansion is not triggered. So around this point T0, you can observe that the input has almost died down to zero and output has not st started to come up. So if you change the bandwidth of the system around this point, the pulse width expands, and this expansion, expansion factor is approximately 1.8x. And this is an example of a compression. So you have this fat pulse around this, this location here, you double the bandwidth of the system, or in this case, we double, uh, I mean, the factor was 1.7x, and you get a pulse of width of approximately 1.25 nanoseconds. Uh, finally, to conclude, we demonstrated an area efficient pulse expansion and compression technique, which you can use in an IC, and which, which showed, to, which has improved the state of the art area efficiency by 3x. And I'd like to end by acknowledging uh, the help and support of my guide, 
and this work was also uh, funded by Department of Science and Technology, Government of India. Thank you. So if you have any questions, I can right. take it. Thank you. So we have uh, three minutes left for any questions uh, that you might have for Imun. Yes, uh, moment you switch from inductors to GMs, uh, those are active circuits, you will have noise, but that's always a trade-off between active, active and passive. Uh, no, okay, it, 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 no, actually in most applications, in some of the applications, the noise levels are such that uh, you can suppress them. And fundamentally, you can suppress the noise of any circuit by increasing its current. If you increase the GM, the noise goes down. So as long as you are willing to pay with power, you can do that. In principle, you can get whatever you want, but uh, there were some practical issues that we found while designing this. So that's why it was limited to 1.8x. We plan to do a, a advanced version of that where we would like to demonstrate at least uh, maybe a factor of two improvement over that. Okay, so the delay line that we had was uh, giving a delay of approximately three nanoseconds. Uh, and we were dealing with signals which had uh, width of less than two nanoseconds of that order. One question. I can't hear you. Is there a limit on the expansion or contraction? Okay. Okay, so if I, I okay, I don't have it anyways. So, so as long as you don't encroach into the territory of the next pulse that, coming, that comes in, you are, you, know, you are free. So it's application dependent. Okay, so if there are no more questions, let's thank uh, Imon once again.